most Winx Club fans are not very big fans of anything post season four, aka the Nickelodeon and post Nickelodeon eras. The writing took a gradual nosedive as Rainbow and Nickelodeon attempted to create a soft reboot of the series, in which the Winx were quietly made into 16 year old students at Althea once again, and kept that way indefinitely for branding and merchandising purposes. As such, I kind of went ahead and rewrote season five several times over the years. Those familiar with my content for far longer back in the bad times, you'll remember my glorified fanfic shit, I mean, rewrite, rewrite videos for Ruby, part of which were built on Celtic Phoenix's far superior Fixing Ruby series. But my original obsession with rewriting existing stories to better understand story structure came from Winx Club. And so we're gonna be doing a couple videos exploring my latest rewrite of season five, with today's video following the first half, episodes one through 14. The general plot involving Tritanus, Cyrenix, and the Infinite Ocean are kept intact, but I have made some changes in terms of plot line and tone. The Winx will indeed be returning to the magical universe, but there will be no reverting back to 16. The Winx resume their teaching assistant roles at Althea, and their primary goal is to oversee Roxy's studies at Althea until she's one day ready to succeed Nebula as Queen of the Terrestrial Fairies, and help Earth in its transition into magic returning, possibly even one day being welcomed into the magical universe. This timeline also does not involve the events of Magical Adventure, so many of that movie's events have not taken place. Yet. Foreshadowing. I mention this because part of season 5's plot, specifically in the first half, will use elements, plot lines, and locations from Magical Adventure. Now these will be basic descriptions of events and storylines. I'm not going to be describing every single scene with every single detail, because honestly, you never really figure all that stuff out until you're actually writing, and a lot of time, stuff changes when you're doing an actual full production. So please just consider this fan fiction, except instead of lengthy prose, it's all just outlines made into a shitty video. Cool? Cool. God damn it. I said I wouldn't be self-deprecating for 2020. Baby steps. Baby steps. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive in. Get it? D -d dive in? Cause, cause ocean. I oh, forget it. Let's just, let's just do this. Our story begins a couple weeks after the end of season four, but we start not on Earth, but in the oceans of Andros. Aisha has been spending some time here and there with her family, including her aunt Ligeia's family. Before any of y'all ask, it's an honorary family tie, not a blood tie. I, I feel like that should be obvious, but then again, it's magic, so like, who cares? I'm, I'm gonna stop myself now. Right now, she and Tressa are racing through an underwater gorge and cave system, with Aisha riding her signature surfboard made of Morphix. Aisha just barely wins the race through her cunning, although Tressa notes that her cousin's strategy was a tad reckless. After the race, they chat a bit about how Aisha is feeling. She's come to accept what's happened to Naboo, and for the most part, she focuses on the here and now, because she honestly is unable to imagine an entirely new future with him gone. She's especially not looking forward to Naboo's memorial service, which is being held in Gardenia as a celebration of the short yet festive life they shared on Earth. To Aisha, she wants this to be a celebration of her and Naboo's life, not mourning the future that they lost, but she also worries about how Naboo's parents will react, as she hasn't seen them since informing them about Naboo's death, and last she heard, they weren't exactly fond of this service being so unorthodox and not even being held on Andros. That's when Nereus, Tressa's older brother, finds them. He's been looking for them as well as his twin brother Tritanus, as the royal family is needed for the official opening, or rather reopening, of the Ocean Gate to Earth. They find Tritanus hunting a sea serpent in a nearby trench, which he kills mercilessly, much to everyone else's disgust, as this creature was simply caring about its own business. Yet for Tritanus, he views this as a proud accomplishment no one else really acknowledges. The ceremony for the Ocean Gate opening is rather brief. With magic returned to Earth, many magical creatures are beginning to appear across the planet, and now a new Selkie is born beside the gate. 
She is named Phila and named the Guardian of the Ocean Gate to Earth. Everyone seems excited, though Tritanus notably does not care in the slightest, even getting into a fight about why anyone would care about such a backwater world. Tritanus leaves, claiming to be heading back to the Coral Palace, but rather he's meeting with some of his loyal followers, many of them soldiers in the city of Triton's battalion, about a plan to usurp the throne from Queen Ligeia and Crown Princess Tressa. In Gardenia, meanwhile, where summer has officially begun, the Winx, save for Stella, more on that later, finish a day of work at Love and Pet like usual, where Morgana has been interning to learn the daily proceedings. Once the Winx head off to the magical universe, Morgana will be taking over the reins here so that the fairy pets will continue to find good homes, and the people of Gardenia will still be introduced to magic in a manageable way. They then head to the fruity music bar with the specialists, save for Skye and Brandon, to relax as usual far too exhausted for any kind of concert. Musa is tempted to jump onto the stage and sing a bit, but decides not to. We get a little conversation between her and Riven where we learn that because the Winx are focusing on helping Roxy to one day succeed Nebula, they elected not to sign the recording contract with Jason. Musa and Riven are bummed about it, but Musa asserts that her dreams aren't being given up, simply put on the back burner. And Riven wants to be as supportive as possible because we're not having this stupid drama with them anymore. Roxy, meanwhile, is kind of terrified at the idea of going to Alfia soon. She's so used to Earth, so the idea of being far away from home for an extended period of time is incredibly intimidating for her, especially given her only glimpse of the magical universe was an icy hellscape of a prison planet. Uh, yeah, that's that's not the best first impression. Bloom encourages her that she'll be able to handle things just fine, and when Roxy makes a comment of Bloom being like a big sister to her, Bloom kind of freezes up as she recalls her and Daphne's talk over Lake Rockaluche from The Secret of the Lost Kingdom. Before Roxy can inquire about Bloom getting distracted, Kiko winds up spilling some carrot juice that Roxy made for him and Roxy rushes to get supplies to clean it up. Bloom heads outside to get some fresh air, and for a bit of comedy, Flora helpfully cleans up the mess with some magic, which leads to Roxy commenting on how magic really irritates her sometimes. Out on the beach, Bloom summons and dons Daphne's mask, which she's kept with her since the movie. Of course, since Daphne has never seen Earth for herself, the image through the mask does not change whatsoever, and Bloom wonders if Daphne is in a better place now, as she hasn't seen her spirit since Domino was restored. Right then, Bloom gets a call from Brandon. He and Stella have been helping Skye prepare for the service, and as Brandon promises that Skye will be there despite his duties as King of Arachleon, Stella tries to give Skye a pep talk about asking Bloom to set a wedding date which Skye plans to make official with a special pendant he's made for Bloom himself. The service is held a few days later, and Aisha arrives with her parents and extended family, quickly reuniting with the other Winks. Skye, Brandon, and Stella have yet to arrive, which exacerbates Bloom's anxiety. Naboo's parents, meanwhile, have been completely silent, not talking to anyone, which also stresses Aisha the hell out. Thankfully, it's not too long until Skye arrives with Brandon and Stella. Skye pulls Bloom off to the side where he pours his heart out to Bloom and admits he's been considering asking her to set a wedding date. Bloom is excited, but isn't sure if they're ready to handle that yet, especially given what happened to Naboo, and the fact that if they were to marry, they would still have to find a workaround for somehow ruling over both Domino and Arachleon, which they had both elected to not think about for the time being. Sky is disappointed, but understands, electing not to tell her about the pendant he'd made. Aisha tries to speak with Naboo's parents, meanwhile, and his father, Marduk, simply makes passive-aggressive comments about how Naboo sacrificed himself for such an inconsequential world. That's when Aisha notices that Naboo's mother, Sagittum, is wearing the flower more Morgana created to hold Naboo's essence in her hair. Aisha is unsure of how to feel about this as she wants to respect Naboo's parents' wishes, yet she hoped that they might plant the flower. As Aisha gives her speech about what Naboo's sacrifice means for the future of both Earth and the magical universe, Tritanus orders his men to enact their plan. Far offshore, Triton soldiers wearing masks attack an oil rig, causing a massive explosion which leads to an oil spill, threatening to spread through the nearby ocean gate to Andros. The Winx see this and immediately rush to action, transforming into Believix and using their Zoomix wings to teleport out there, bringing Roxy and Morgana with them while the specialists go fetch their vehicles. The fairies do their best to minimize the damage and stop the oil, and once the specialists arrive, they get all of the workers onto the owl. However, while they try to stop the oil, the Winx find that somehow the pollution has been infused with dark magic, making the task infinitely more difficult and dangerous. 
Aisha, meanwhile, spots the Trident soldiers trying to flee, and she immediately goes after them, only to find her Believix wings incredibly inefficient underwater because they're the size of monster trucks. She winds up detransforming to fight and takes them down, forcing the truth out of them, that this was all just a distraction to get the wings away. Back at the Fruity Music Bar, Tritanus takes advantage of the situation to have his men attack the guests. While Neptune and Araeus fight the soldiers, Ligeia, as well as Aisha's parents, lead Naboo's parents to safety. Tressa manages to hold her own against Tritanus, only to be injured trying to protect Nereus. Ligeia quickly ends the fight with the light of her coral gem, and Tritanus and his men are apprehended and arrested. Back at the rig, Sky heads further inside to find anyone who might be trapped. He notices, however, strange shadows and hears cackling. And when he spots the source of the dark magic that's being bestowed onto the oil before it pours out into the sea, another explosion leaves the wreck in tatters. The Winx finds Sky among the debris in the water. Bloom tries to heal him with her dragon flame, but he's still barely breathing and won't wake up. Sky's pendant, meanwhile, undiscovered by anyone else, sinks into the sea. Everyone returns to the fruity music bar to rest in the aftermath. Aisha's family returns to Andros, where Ligeia and Neptune plan to toss Tritanus into the most secure undersea prison for his crimes. The specialist, meanwhile, takes Sky to Arachleon for treatment, and Bloom simply cries from shock, unsure of what to think. Tritanus is tossed into the Black Shark prison, which, as you guessed it, is shaped like a shark. Well, the shark itself is an entrance to the Trent prison we saw back in Season 3, and is also inspired by this shark from the Infinite Ocean. On the way in, Tritanus is startled by a massive water dragon kept in its own magical prison, and it seems to observe him with intelligent but callous regard. Tritanus is thrown into the prison's darkest depths, where we get a reintroduction to his prison mates in the next cell over. Icy, Darcy, and Stormy. <laughs> we are the Tricks! <laughs> We now cut to a few weeks later, following the memorial service and oil spill. Bloom is unable to focus on her work in Love and Pet, so Stella takes over while Bloom gets some fresh air. She texts Brandon about whether he has any updates about Skye, to which he replies that Skye is still stable, but there's no sign of him waking up anytime soon. Aisha goes to check on her, and Bloom tries to put on a brave face, specifically because she doesn't want to upset any of her friends especially Aisha. But rather, Aisha insists that Bloom let herself express how she's feeling and talk about it with the others. Aisha double checks with Bloom as to whether she feels up to the benefit concert the next day, and Bloom insists that she'll do it because she believes it's the right thing to do. On Andros, meanwhile, Tritanus is frustrated with what's happened, believing he was the only person strong and ruthless enough to deserve becoming the ruler of the oceans of Andros. All his life, he's felt like he's been expected to accept bowing to his sister, and the tricks, especially Icy, exacerbate his fury. Of course, Icy is just trying to play him along, albeit with some impromptu flirtiness, which Darcy and Stormy ruthlessly mock her for. I think we're a lot alike. I think we're a lot alike. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, Icy snaps back at Darcy, mentioning when she fell for Riven, because that's how the tricks roll. It's also here we learn that the tricks were originally sent to Light Rock Monastery at the end of the third season, but broke out shortly thereafter, only to turn themselves in on Andros with no explanation. Icy simply states that without the Winx present, they didn't find their usual conquest any fun, but it's clear there's something else going on. Something. fishy. God damn it, Bar! Icy shares that she knows how Tritanus' desire for power feels, as that's what drove her to become who she is now. Is this potential hinting at her backstory and how she came to pledge herself to the ancestral witches? Mayhaps. Nereus does visit to try and get through to Tritanus, but Tritanus asserts that he no longer considers Nereus, nor the others, his family, forcing Nereus to leave heartbroken. Out in the seas of Earth, meanwhile, the pollution tainted by the dark magic seems to be moving with a life force of its own. Phila, who is overseeing construction of a new Selkie village with newborn Earth Selkies, spots this and attempts to stop the oil, only to be knocked back by an incredibly dark power. The oil passes through the Ocean Gate to Andros, alerting Lemmy, the keeper of Andros, 
Andros's gates. The two Selkies rush to follow the oil and investigate it as it approaches the Black Shark. In Gardenia, meanwhile, the Winks finally give their benefit concert to help raise donations and awareness of the oil spill, then help lead a volunteer effort to clean up the beach. Mike and Vanessa, Bloom's adoptive Earth parents, are here to help, but right then everyone is caught off guard by a dragon-themed airship landing on the beach. Enter King Oratel and Queen Miriam of Domino, as Oratel insisted that they help, then stay to keep an eye on Bloom and escort her back to Elfia. Bloom is a tad annoyed at this, especially given the Winks aren't headed back to Elfia for a couple more weeks, but after what happened to Skye, Oratel mentions that he has a bad feeling about things and simply wants to protect his daughter. At the very least, with the help of Mike and Vanessa, along with Miriam, Bloom convinces Oratel to have himself and his men help with the beach cleanup. Back on Andros, the oil has entered the Black Shark prison, and neither the Selkies nor the guards are able to stop it, and anyone who is touched by the oil winds up transformed into a hideous, monstrous mutation, including the Kraken, which guards the prison, which goes on a rampage. The oil then somehow consolidates, transforming into a mysterious dark trident presenting itself before Tritanus. He takes it and immediately undergoes a painful transformation into a mutant, with the power to control the other mutants in the prison. With his new dark power, Tritanus breaks free and releases the tricks, breaking the seal which kept them from fully using their powers. Tritanus attempts to take control of the water dragon only for it to go wild, attack them with magic of its own, then flee at an alarming speed. The tricks seem particularly frustrated, but Tritanus dismisses this content with the size of his current army, which he plans to grow expertly. Exponentially. Spotting Lemmy and Phila, the tricks capture them and present them to Tritanus, who absorbs their powers, leaving them helpless and giving him the ability to use the ocean gates of Earth and Andros freely. He mentions an old legend passed down amongst the Tritons that there is a secret gate to a dimension of endless ocean which holds incredible secrets, and decides to test the legend by taking the powers of all the Selkies which would stand to benefit him regardless. Tritanus' first desire is vengeance upon his family, but Icy convinces him to target the Winks instead, specifically his cousin Aisha. Tritanus seems hostile to the idea, his mutation making him grow even more aggressive, but Icy suggests that there will be even more pollution to strengthen him on Earth. And so, wishing to satiate his addiction, Tritanus agrees, and his forces head out for Earth. The cleanup resumes at the Fruity Music Bar, where everyone is making significant progress. It looks like they'll be finishing up just as sunset approaches. That is, however, until the temperature drops rapidly. A massive storm is suddenly rolling in as the sea freezes over, snowflakes falling. Immediately, the Winks pick up what's going on and tell everyone to get inside, and panic ensues as the snowflakes begin to freeze over whatever they touch. As Bloom rushes to help Mike and Vanessa, a bolt of lightning knocks her backwards, causing her to fall into the frozen over sea. The others rush to help her, but a wall of darkness blocks their path, and that same darkness surrounds Bloom, blacking out her eyes and rendering her blind. The ice cracks and she falls into the water, and Tritanus' mutant followers attempt to drag her down. Instinctively, she uses her powers to force them back and raise herself up, melting much of the ice. And Oratel comes to her rescue to pull her out and back to shore while Miriam restores her sight. And it is here that Tritanus' forces have surfaced on terrifying display along with the tricks, to which the Winx, Roxy, and Morgana transform and go, Ooh, it's fighting time! Now, I want to note I tend to leave action out for the most part when I write because it tends to be better to figure that out when you're animating, but I did want to specify some ideas, specifically given we're done with the era of generic beams and bolts of energy. Some ideas I had include, but are not limited to, Flora parting Stormy's Tempest by using Summer Thunder, where she legit makes her own thunderstorm because our girl wields the power of nature, goddammit. Oh, maybe it can rain rose petals, actually along with Icy making an ice platform echoing back to the slab she made back in Season 3. It's time to go nuts and show how strong the Winx are, basically. Oh, also, having Musa use her new crystal voice spell so that the Winx can project their voices across the huge distance to basically tell Tritanus, prepare to get your ass kicked. During the fight, Icy makes snide comments about the Winx thinking they're all-powerful, bringing magic back to Earth, and taking a new pixie, Roxy, under their enormous wings. She even takes a jab at the fact Enchantix was supposedly their final transformation, yet here they are with a new form which she calls incredibly tacky. Bloom fires back about how the tricks are still stuck in their ways, doomed to repeat their mistakes over and over, and how she honestly pities them. And this really sets Icy off and makes her way more aggressive. 
Ice even goes as far to mention that Bloom and the Winx have no idea what they have in store, and soon they'll have the power of the infinite ocean to extinguish the dragon flame. Bloom is confused by this, but Aisha's kinda too busy fighting Tritanus to really make a comment, because she she knows what Icy talking about. Eventually, Tritanus reluctantly decides that the best course of action is to retreat, and he begrudgingly calls his army through an ocean gate to Andrus that he opens on the spot. They all pass through, but he winds up leaving one mutant, along with the Trix, behind. And so the Trix flee while the specialists, by which I mean literally just Riven, Timmy, and Helia, capture the mutant and plan to take it back to Red Fountain to study. With the fight over, Blue mentions what Icy said to Aisha, and immediately Aisha is mortified. The Winx elect to head back to Elfia early to to consult Farragonda, and while Roxy is a bit upset by this, she understands given the gravity of the situation. Again, Oratel offers a ride, but Bloom insists that they'll be fine given that they can teleport. This kinda confuses Oratel a bit, because he still needs a summary of what happened on Earth, and what the Believix powers even are, but the Winx decide that there's no real time to explain any of this. Tritanus, meanwhile, has found a crevice for himself on Andros, where he and his army can remain hidden for a time. He sees the light of the city of Tritons from a distance, and he vows to have it fall by his hand. His conquest is about to begin. We begin with a news clip from It's Magix, which is basically the go-to news channel in the magical universe. They report the recent assassination attempt by Prince Tritanus of the Oceans of Andros, which no one has agreed to officially comment on. They do mention, however, that it appears there was a massive breakout at the Black Shark prison, which the royals insist is simply due to the prisoners being moved for a time to allow for maintenance on the facility. The segment then segues to the rumored return of the Winx to the magical universe after their long absence. They defer to Venomia, a reporter and vehement critic of the fairies, who is at Alfia asking around for the Winx Club's whereabouts, specifically for comments on rumors about the tricks breaking out of prison yet again. Griselda and Venomia have a bit of a standoff, with Griselda coming to the Winx's defense. Quote, even Stella. But Farragonda is the one to turn Venomia away. We then follow Farragonda as she enters the Hall of Enchantments from the first episode of Season 4, where the Winx and Roxy await. With the nonsense averted, they get down to business. Uh, no. But that would be fun. They discuss something Tritanus and the Trix mentioned, which specifically freaked out Aisha the infinite ocean. It's here we learn that there are many dimensions beyond the magical universe, some of which we've already encountered, like Relix and the Golden Kingdom. The infinite ocean, however, is special in that it is home to the power which opposes the dragon flame, the power which fueled the water stars back in season three. You see, way back in the boring before times, the great dragon was basically having a dumb turf war with this water-based entity now known as the Leviathan because their existences literally threatened each other's lives. But then, when the Shadow Phoenix, the dark equivalent of the Great Dragon, popped up, the dragon and the Leviathan beat the shit out of the Phoenix together, then agreed to leave each other the hell alone. The Great Dragon would create the magical universe, then, I don't know, die or something to make Domino, while the Leviathan made its own universe called the Infinite Ocean. The Water Stars were simply one way to contain the power of the Leviathan, but if someone were to gain access to the infinite ocean, they could literally tear the fabric of reality apart and basically kill us all. The Winx consult the Great Book of Fairies, but find no information whatsoever on the infinite ocean, nor the transformation created to safeguard it, Sirenix. And that is because, according to Farragonda, the Light Rock Council made any information regarding the infinite ocean or Sirenix absolutely off-limits. So while Farragonda talks with the Council about how to proceed, the Winx decide that all they really can do for now is keep an eye out for anything suspicious, leave the hunt for Tritanus up to the kingdoms of Andros, and reprise their teaching positions at Alfia as planned. They do ask about their Believix forms, however, and Farragonda explains that the Winx will be able to use any higher level forms that they've earned interchangeably. So with their mission on Earth complete, Believix isn't really going to be necessary anymore, but they will still have access to all of its powers, abilities, and buffs. Am I foreshadowing something? 
mayhaps. We then have a brief montage in which the Winks help oversee different classes, sometimes in pairs, otherwise assisting Palladium, Wizgiz, or Avalon. And, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be going all that well for any of them, since none of them can focus on the task at hand with all the stress going on. After the montage, Roxy overhears some students taking jabs at the Winks, but when she tries to come to their defense, they take shots at her from being from a planet no one even cares about. Roxy tries to talk to Bloom and Flora about this, but Bloom gets a but Bloom gets a text from Brandon about Sky and has to take off immediately. Flora, meanwhile, tries to give Roxy some advice on being patient that things will work out, but Roxy likes just to go back to her dorm and get a head start on homework, which makes Flora feel she's unable to help any of her friends. Along the way to her dorm, Roxy runs into Elfia's janitor, Nut, who's having difficulty with some magic beavers that have snuck in and are causing havoc. Using her powers, Roxy manages to communicate with the beavers, discovering that their habitat has been overtaken by some students and littered with their garbage, because they suck. With some help from Griselda, the pair finds the site in the nearby woods, and Griselda will be staking the place out with some observation spells. And whoever is behind these parties? Well, they're not out to destroy the magical universe, but they will be a prick. Bloom and Stella, meanwhile, use their Zoomix wings to teleport to Arachleon, where Bloom rushes in to see Skye against Arendor, Samara, and even Brandon's warnings. She hugs him, only for Skye to freak out and ask who she is. Bloom is in shock. It's then we learn that Skye is still suffering from a concussion, fatigue, and severe panic attacks, but to make matters worse, he appears to have developed both retrograde amnesia, which means he's lost all existing memories, and enterograde amnesia, which means he can't form any new memories. Essentially, Skye does not remember who he is, where he's from, or anyone he loves, nor is he able to remember them upon meeting them again. The royal doctor believes Skye's condition to be traumatic, though there seems to be strange traces of dark magic in his mind, which concerns everyone. Unsure of what to say or do, Brandon assures that he'll be helping to take care of Skye, while Erendor assumes Skye's duties as King of Arachleon. And so a heartbroken Bloom returns to Althea, with Stella trying to keep her hopeful that Skye might get better, but the odds of it aren't stellar. God damn it, boy! Aisha, meanwhile, is out and about in Magic City with Musa and Tecna. They're heading to a new restaurant called the White Horse Cafe down by the beach, where they plan to meet with Riven, Timmy, and Helia, who've just gotten themselves an apartment in the city. And they're basically trying to take their mind off things. Once they arrive, Helia is kinda bummed out that Flora was not feeling up to going out, and he winds up venting his feelings through a poem once the owner, Greta, calls for an open mic. This catches the attention of one of the cafe's patrons, Princess Crystal of Linfea, who aggressively flirts with him, much to Helia's dismay, and to everyone's concern, given Crystal is significantly younger. Musa, meanwhile, goes up to perform at Riven's encouragement, and they actually wind up singing a duet and rocking it. During this, Aisha sees that she's missed several calls from her parents and rushes outside. Before Tecna can go after her, Venomia, who has been staking the place out, jumps in her way and asks her several intrusive questions. Timmy does try to help, and when Venomia asks about a new Earth exhibit at the Museum of Magic and whether the Winks are dedicated to helping the magical universe learn about their mission, Tecna hesitantly says that they'll definitely be giving a presentation soon, all the while wanting to die inside. Out on the beach, Aisha calls her mother, and as Niobe begins describing the situation, we transition to the oceans of Andros, where Neptune is furious about Tritanus' escape. Ligeia, however, maintains that they keep the situation on a need-to-know basis to avoid mass panic, and tasks Neptune and Nereus with leading an effort to scour the oceans for Tritanus and stop him. Tressa wishes to help, but Ligeia maintains that as a crown princess, she is far too important to risk being transformed or even killed by Tritanus. Tritanus, meanwhile, manages to mutate several schools of fish, along with a couple of manta rays, testing out how much he can expand his army and what purpose his new minions can serve. He hears Icy's voice, then turns to see the tricks are communicating with him through a window of dark magic. Right now, the tricks are hiding out in the ruins of Shadowhaunt, Darkar's old fortress deep in the Underrealm. Icy is still upset that Tritanus fled, but Tritanus asserts he had no choice, and to keep this alliance going, Icy just lets the issue go. 
Demanding for more information on the infinite ocean, Tritanus asks the Trix to keep an eye on the Winx, specifically in learning about the Sirenix transformation. Begrudgingly, the Trix accept and close the portal. The voices of three old hags chastise the Trix for not being more careful in keeping Tritanus' trust, and here we finally get our reveal that the ancestral witches, Belladonna, Listless, and Tharma, are very much still around and have been pulling the strings behind Tritanus' rise to power, including the oil spill and Sky's current condition. The Trix ask how they're supposed to stand a chance against the Winx given their new powers, and the Ancestral Witches mention that the relics of their powers remain in the Halls of Shadowhaunt. And it's here the Trix get their own power up and assume their, as the fandom refers to them, Dark Witch forms from Season 6, putting them on par with the Winx. The Trix decide that the Winx will need a little bit of a push to seek out Sirenix, and decide this will be the perfect opportunity to give their powers a test run. We then cut to the Museum of Magic, where the Winx are stressed about their presentation, which they had to throw together at the last minute, with some help from Roxy about Earth, along with its culture and their mission there. It's right in the middle of this presentation, however, that the Tricks reveal themselves and a fight ensues. It's also here, however, that the Winx decide to bust out an old favorite transformation of theirs, the most beloved of fairy forms, Enchantix. The fight here is largely inspired by both the fight from the original Return to Alfia episode, as well as the opening fight at Alfia from Magical Adventure, including the song Good Girls, Bad Girls, because why not? For the most part, it's meant to creatively show off the Winx and Trix fighting when they're on equal footing, welcome back Enchantix, and also have Tecna and Aisha calm the worried crowd with their Believix therapeutic spells, specifically to show that, as Faragonda said, they still have access to their Believix powers while using Enchantix. Also during this fight, Bloom winds up coming across a section of the museum she's never seen before about her sister Daphne the Nymph, including the other eight nymphs she fought alongside, one of whose names stands out, Politea. Once the fight is over and the tricks make their intentions to acquire Sirenix clear, the press, including Venomia, press to the Winx what Sirenix is exactly, how they plan to stop the tricks, and even whether they believe they'll be up to the task. Eh, uh, thing, things are not exactly looking all that great. We begin the episode with news crews surrounding Althea. Bloom, trying to hide her identity with a coat, uses her Zumix wings to teleport to Lake Rockaluche, where she dons Daphne's mask and attempts to communicate with her. Daphne does respond, though it's clear it's difficult for her to manifest. Ah, uh, why does everyone want me while I'm recording? Why must I be popular? Bloom asks whether Daphne might know anything about Sirenix, but Daphne advises Bloom not to pursue any knowledge about the form, as not only is it forbidden by the Light Rock Council, but the power itself is cursed. She even lost a friend who pursued Sirenix. And when Bloom asks if this was her fellow nymph Politea, Daphne draws the last line in the sand and makes Bloom promise that she won't pursue Sirenix. Bloom can't make that promise, and frustrated Daphne just gives Bloom one final warning before vanishing in a powerful gust of wind. We then cut to Light Rock Monastery, where the Winks arrive with Farragonda, meeting up with Headmistress Griffin of Cloud Tower, Headmaster Celadine of Red Fountain, and King Ortel and Queen Miriam. It's a great old reunion for the Company of Light up in this bitch, which is timely given we're about to go into a hearing with the Light Rock Council about why suddenly everyone and their grandma knows about Sirenix. Also want to footnote that Roxy is not present here, and one of the Winks will make a comment about hating leaving Roxy behind. From now on, just assume when I say the Winks, I'm excluding Roxy unless otherwise specified. Don't worry, we're not pretending Roxy doesn't exist, it's, it's just a temporary thing. Anyways, the Light Rock Council is kind of pissed that people are suddenly asking about Sirenix, given that since it's the only way to access the infinite ocean, whoever wields it could pose a grave threat to the magical universe. The Winx attempt to explain themselves, but it also kind of winds up turning into a debate about them bringing magic back to Earth without the Council's knowledge and, uh, 
It's a shit show, to say the least. Stella does fire back about the Council sending the tricks to Andros, where they could break out, because she's Stella, but she uh, quickly shuts up, convinced that they're about to smite her. With the tricks going after Sirenix, however, the Winx propose that they be given the Council's blessing, as well as guidance, to find the power and to safeguard it. The Council is very hesitant, and even Farragonda and Saladin aren't sure about this, though Griffin argues that the tricks are relentless, and she trusts only the Winx to be able to stop them. Begrudgingly, the Council offers the Winx a deal. If they are able to receive the boon of the ancestral spirit of nature, they will be given the missing pages about Cyrenix and the Infinite Ocean from the Book of Fairies, and allowed to pursue the Cyrenix quest. Yeah, that's right, this transformation requires a quest. An odyssey, if you will. We then cut to the world of Graenor, the ancestral home of fairies, where it's said that the very first fairy Arcadia received her fairy wings and the power of fairies, which was believed in by the people, took root and became the now beautiful Tree of Fairies. That name is uh, pending, and yes, it is different from the Tree of Life, which is also different from the other other Tree of Life from season two. That one I'm renaming, it's uh, different trees. Is there a Tree of Witches? I don't know, but mm. The ancestral spirit of nature reveals herself tasking the wings to find the legendary yet elusive creature of the rainbow mantle, tame them, and lead them back to the tree of fairies. Then, and only then, will the Trix receive the ancestral spirit's boon. Tecna proposes that to cover as much ground as possible, the wings split into pairs. Bloom and Stella will search the mountains, Musa and Aisha will search the wetlands, and Flora and Tecna will search the forest. At the very least, they feel they should be fine given only fairies and other beings of light are able to find and enter Graenor, meaning that the tricks won't be a problem for once. We begin with Tecna and Flora's search. Flora uses her spell Nature's Symphony to listen to the forest for guidance, but doesn't get much beyond the weird vague advice of, look into your own heart. Tecna is frustrated and tries to scan the area, only to find the landscape is constantly shifting and messing with her phone. Tecna winds up flipping out and admitting she feels like she hasn't been able to help her friends, like she can't understand why everything seems to be falling apart when returning to Elfia was supposed to have made things better. Flora empathizes, admitting she doesn't trust herself to help the others deal with their problems. Suddenly, Flora hears a strange cry in the distance, but Tecna doesn't hear anything. Flora follows the sound and finds an injured wolf. Flora looks around for Tecna, but Tecna has disappeared. Composing herself, Flora recalls the techniques that her father Rhodos would use to help injured or sick magic wolves back on Linfea. She's never had much luck in taking to her father's studies, but wanting to help the wolf out of desperation, she uses all the power she has and manages to heal its wounds. The wolf stands, and now Flora finds that the creature's fur seems to radiate a pink light. It takes off, and she chases after it. Tecna, meanwhile, has given up trying to find Flora, assuming that Greenor itself is trying to split them up so it can test them individually. As she tries to look around, she winds up falling into a strange pit that was covered by leaves, which has several traps around it that continue to trip her up and test her analytical abilities. But every time she thinks she outsmarts them, another trap activates. That's when she notices a strange creature observing her. And so, Tecna stops and takes a breath, which lures out a small flying squirrel which radiates a strange purple light, and also resembles the Tecworl fairy animals from her home planet of Zenith. She actually manages to strike up a sort of one-sided conversation with the creature, discovering that the traps were left behind by the small critter to protect itself from a predator. Before Tecna can question the presence of a predatory animal on Graenor, the beast strikes. A manticore whose body appears to emanate shadows. Tecna convinces the squirrel to release her, and together they manage to fend off the creature, and Tecna follows the squirrel as it appears to want to lead her somewhere. Musa and Aisha, meanwhile, aren't having much luck over in the wetlands. Musa tries to get Aisha to talk about how she's feeling, but Aisha ends up lashing out from the stress that she's been trying to bottle up. And it's then that, out of nowhere, a massive flood washes through, separating the two. Aisha spots a shadowy creature that she believes caused this, 
and so she transforms into Enchantix and gives chase. Musa, meanwhile, is approached by two creatures, a panther that radiates red light, as well as a hippogriff of sea green light. She transforms to defend herself, but notices that neither creature seems that aggressive. Once she stands down and shows she's willing to listen, she finds the creatures to actually be very intelligent and capable of completely understanding her. Realizing that the hippogriff caused the flooding in an attempt to stop something much much worse. Aisha corners the monster, discovering it to be some sort of massive alligator made out of darkness. Musa arrives in time to help, but when the monster chases after the panther and the hippogriff, they rush after them to try and help. Up in the mountains, Bloom is frustrated that she and Stella have not had any luck, and even freezes up when Stella nearly falls while trying to get her footing from her fear of heights. For reference, Stella is terrified of heights when she isn't transformed. In her own words, I have no problems when I can trust my own damn wings. Uh, give or take the damn. Stella tries to convince Bloom that she trusts her, but that's when a massive earthquake caused by some unseen monster separates the two and sends them falling into crevices within the mountain itself. Stella is okay, but is pinned by rocks and unable to use her magic. Bloom follows her voice and, mustering her courage, reaches her friend, where she frees Stella. The cavern lights up thanks to a unicorn and a bird, which radiate blue and yellow-orange light respectively. The Winks are in some sort of ruin within the mountains, where their powers seem to be negated. That's when the cause of the tremor reveals itself, a chimera of darkness. Cue an impromptu chimera joke from Stella. They rush to escape and find an exit into a forest clearing, where they reunite with the other Winks and see all six beings of light in one place. The monsters, however, gather as well, and after a brief fight, the monsters fuse together into a massive dark hydra, which devours each being of light and runs off to the Tree of Fairies, threatening to spread darkness across all of Graenor. The Winks find themselves unable to fight the monster, and that's when they combine their fairy dust powers with their Believix therapeutic spells, which releases the beings of light, allowing them to fuse together into the true creature of the Rainbow Mantle, a winged fox whose fur shines with all the colors of the rainbow. Its light causes the Hydra to disintegrate, saving Graenor from falling to darkness. The ancestral spirit of nature then reveals herself, congratulating the Winx on passing her trial. The creature of the Rainbow Mantle used the darkness in each girl's heart to manifest their insecurities and fears, and create monsters in situations that would resonate with what they would need to grow as people. They aren't done with their journeys, but rather it was to give each of them an idea of what awaits them on the Sirenix quest. With this, the ancestral spirit of nature gives the Winx her boon, and restores the pages about Sirenix and the infinite ocean into the Book of Fairies. With that, the Winx are ready to begin the Sirenix quest. Meanwhile, at Lake Rockaluche, Daphne's spirit rests within her cave, only to jump when she hears Bloom's voice calling out to her. She goes out to observe, still exhausted and frustrated with her sister, only to find Bloom is nowhere to be seen. Out of the blue, she experiences an excruciating amount of pain as she's enveloped by darkness, and it's here that the ancestral witches reveal themselves, hoping Daphne might be willing to help them learn about Sirenix. We begin this episode with Bloom going to Lake Rockaluche to try to talk to Daphne again. This time about apologizing for her behavior, but also to explain her beginning the Sirenix quest with the Winx since she feels Daphne, at least, is owed an explanation. She gets no response and assumes that Daphne has become so upset that her own sister doesn't want to see her. So while Bloom returns to Alfia disheartened, we get to see the full truth as the ancestral witches mock Daphne for being so cruel to her sister below the waters. Once Bloom returns to Alfia to meet up with the other Winks, it's here that we learn that Tecna got word from Timmy that the mutants at Red Fountain were able to be temporarily healed by fairy dust, but the Tritons still appeared sickly and sought out the corruptive power that turned them, until they wound up transforming back into their mutant forms, meaning that the old fairy dust routine alone is not going to be enough to free Tritanus soldiers. They've also been looking over the new passages in the Book of Fairies, and now with them all together, they pledge themselves to the Sirenix quest, with the caveat that if they do not complete the quest within the next lunar cycle, 
so about a month, or they prove themselves completely unworthy of the power within that time, their connection to the Tree of Fairies will be severed, leaving them without access to their powers. Even Bloom. And I say even Bloom because Dragon Flame and Extinguishable, but nah bitch, not this time. Once the pledge is complete, a new page appears with a mysterious riddle. With every twist and turn, deeper you go, until the shimmering shells sing with the ocean's voice. Aisha presumes that the riddle must be referring to the legendary Shimmering Shells, which are said to be the oldest entities in the oceans of Andros, whose song guided the world's tides and currents to carve out the islands up above, as well as the deep trenches down below. Before they head to Andros, however, Roxy checks in to ask how everything went with the council. They don't have time to fully fill her in, but promise that they'll catch her up once they get back from their next mission. Of course, Roxy's upset, but she just decides to go back to her dorm before her next class. We do get to meet her dorm mates, but I will admit I've not yet decided who they're gonna be, but for the most part, she's not close with any of them. Her roommate is revealed to be Princess Crystal, and Roxy does not get the best impression from her. Meanwhile, we the audience are all like, we see you, we see you, you shady hoe. On Arachleon, meanwhile, Sky is undergoing physical therapy, but is still suffering from severe fatigue and panic attacks. Ortel and Mariam arrive to check in and see if Mariam might be able to help with her healing powers, but Arendor insists that they have the situation under control. We get hints of an old friendship between Ortel and Arendor, but Arendor asserts that he can't keep up with Oratel's antics anymore, given Oratel did not age while he was imprisoned by the ancestral witches, and hesitantly, Oratel and Miriam return to Domino. And it's clear there is something going on with Arendor and not telling them the full story of why he's so distressed. The Winks arrive in the city of Tritons on Andros to check in with Queen Ligeia but there's still no sign of Tritanus anywhere. Bloom is concerned Tritanus might be hiding out on Earth for the time being, and warns Ligeia that it's highly likely he's still in league with the Tricks. Ligeia is well aware of this threat, especially given how weak both Phila and Lemmy have been since Tritanus took their powers, as the two Selkies are still under her care, with unfortunately no sign of recovery anytime soon. Before the Winks head off to resume their quest, Tressa asks Aisha to be careful, and if she sees Tritanus to not show mercy whatsoever to which Aisha happily agrees. Since the shimmering shells are said to guide the currents with their singing, Musa uses her powers and manages to hear a beautiful choir of voices. This leads them to a rather foreboding trench, where they come across what appears to be the entrance to an ancient and undiscovered maze. Aisha recognizes this as the Labyrinth of the Abyss, a place said to have once served as the lair of evil sirens. But Musa insists that the singing is coming from within, and hesitantly, the Winks enter. Once they enter, however, they are immediately separated by a powerful current which seems to be intentionally trying to divide them. Aisha is the only one to resist the current, and spotting its source, one of the Dark Sirens, she gives chase only to lose sight of her and be confronted with what appears to be a Spectre of Naboo. The other Winks, meanwhile, all find themselves lost amidst dark and narrow passageways, where they each experience intense dark illusions based on their insecurities. For Bloom, it's an illusion of Sky that's always just out of reach, unable to recognize her. For Stella, meanwhile, it's herself mocking her ability to help her friends and inspire anyone, which leads to a jab that once Stella becomes Queen of Salaria, her kingdom will crumble under her incompetence. Flora is experiencing everyone giving her the cold shoulder, with each of them crumbling into dust like statues, emphasizing that she can't help them through their problems. Musa has lost both her voice and hearing, leaving her unable to communicate with Riven. And Tecna is being attacked by her fellow Winx, who view her as nothing but a cold-hearted nuisance. We cut back to Aisha, who is being told by Naboo that she let him die, and that if she loves him, she'll kill the fairy hunters. Ogron's laughter mortifies her, and she turns to see the Wizards of the Black Circle attacking the other Winx and tearing off their wings. Aisha rushes to stop them, but when she's about to kill Ogron, she stops herself and realizes that this isn't what Naboo would have wanted at all. Instead, she imprisons the wizards with her powers, and immediately the specters all vanish, and she hears the singing that Musa heard earlier. Aisha enters a cavern where the shimmering shells await. They congratulate her on her ability to overcome great hardship and adversity without falling to darkness and so she is bestowed with the Gem of Resilience, the first of six gems needed to complete the Sirenix quest, which will prove that each of the Winks are worthy of the power. This lifts the illusions experienced by the other Winks, but even though the Labyrinth allows them to reunite, 
Everyone but Aisha is incredibly shaken up by their experience. They exit and prepare to head back to Alfia, only for Aisha to find yet another missed call, this time from Tressa about an emergency. Tritanus and his forces have launched a full-scale assault on the city of Tritons, and the Coral Palace is under siege. Begins some time before the Winks even arrived on Andros for their latest mission, following Neptune and Nereus' search for Tritanus. This search brings them to a strait where they're immediately ambushed by Tritanus mutants, which appear even more numerous than before. Tritanus reveals himself, and after a brutal rematch with his father and brother, he transforms both into mutants, each with unique forms and easily the most powerful of his minions. With this, Tritanus is content that he's ready to take the Coral Throne especially after absorbing the power of Neptune's trident. He contacts the Trix, asking they provide him assistance in his siege, and they readily accept. Once the conversation ends, the Trix head to Andros while the Ancestral Witches continue their questioning of Daphne in Darkar's old throne room. Daphne seems to give in to the torture, telling them that they'll be able to find answers about Cyrenix in the Magic Archive at Althea. And so, the Ancestral Witches leave Daphne imprisoned while they, confident in their ability to move about without drawing attention to themselves, head for Elfia, and once they do, Daphne grins. She got a plan. I'll get ya, I'll get ya, and when I do, you're gonna be busted. In the city of Tritons, which is currently being protected by a magical barrier, Tressa goes about her daily life with her friends, trying to keep a level head even when people ask her about Tritanus. That is when she notices, however, giant mutant manta rays just flying over the city all creepily. She catches on to what's happening and rushes to the palace right as Tritanus launches his attack. She tries to call Aisha but gets no response, and right as she reaches the Coral Palace, the shield breaks and Tritanus' army invades. Tritanus shows absolutely no mercy, mutating the citizens on sight and expanding his army even further. He reaches the palace where Tressa confronts him and challenges him to a duel, provoking his ego. They battle and Tressa manages to hold her own rather well, though when Tritanus has the mutated Neptune and Nereus attack her, Tressa has a harder time fighting back. Her sword is tossed away and Tritanus mutates her. That's when Ligeia, however, reveals herself at the top of the Coral Palace, having been preparing a massive spell with her Coral Gem. The light paralyzes Tritanus' forces and begins to even undo the mutations. Unfortunately for her, the Trix arrive and attack Ligeia from behind, shattering the Coral Gem, and the mutations take hold once again. Ligeia makes one last attempt to apologize to Tritanus for, for whatever she did that allowed this to happen, but unsatisfied, Tritana simply mutates her, declaring himself king of the oceans of not only Andros, but all the worlds of the magical universe. Tritanus discovers the ailing Lemmy and Phila, and holds Phila hostage to force the weakened Lemmy to open telepathic communication with the other ocean gatekeepers. Tritanus then orders the other keepers to come to Andros and surrender their powers within the next hour, or he'll kill both Phila and Lemmy. He also sends out the tricks to make sure that the Winks don't try to interfere. The Winks, meanwhile, teleport to the city of Triton's outskirts, where they can see it covered with dark pollution, meaning that they're already too late. Before they hatch a plan, they're approached by the Selkies Tritanus summoned. Serena of Domino, Illyris of Solaria, Daisy Reed of Linfea, Sona of Melody, Lithia of Zenith, and Nyssa of Magix, among other keepers. Bloom finds something oddly familiar about Serena's name, but can't quite place it. The Selkies inform the Winks of Tritanus' hostage situation, and Tecna has no idea how they'll be able to take on Tritanus' army without Lemmy and Phila being killed. But Stella jokes that maybe a trick of the light will be enough to fool him, which gives Tecna an idea. At Alfea, meanwhile, Roxy's not having much luck with her classes and, feeling especially bored and neglected by the Winx, decides to go exploring the campus. Of course, the other fairies aren't fond of her, especially Crystal, who reveals that Griselda wound up busting her parties to win over the other freshmen and gave them all detention. But you better believe me when I tell you that I finally got the dirt on you. 
Nut comes to Roxy's defense, but Crystal, saying this isn't over, simply storms off. Roxy, however, notices a strange shadow moving about the corridors. Nut is terrified, of course, but Roxy tells him to go tell Farragonda while she follows. The shadows head for the Magic Archive, and when Concorda and her pixie pets notice, they're knocked out. Roxy comes to their rescue, and the ancestral witches reveal themselves and attack. Thankfully, Farragonda arrives just in time to drive them off, but with the revelation of the witch's return, things become infinitely more tense. This is how it's gonna be when she finds out that I was always right, you Back on Andros, the Selkies arrive to surrender themselves to Tritanus. However, only five of them are present, Serena, Illyris, Daisy Reed, Sona, and Lithia, and this greatly aggravates Tritanus. The Selkies argue that it's only to ensure Phila and Lemmy are okay, and Darcy reveals that she has the two in one of her traps. Stormy notes how annoying the Selkies' voices are, but Tritanus dismisses her statement and prepares to take their powers. Illyris, however, starts to praise Tritanus about what a fantastic king he'll be, and this does manage to distract him for a little bit. Enough for Aisha, along with Nyssa, to use her fairy dust to break Darcy's cage. Darcy catches on, however, and dispels the deception. Stella had used her light powers to create her own type of illusion. She notes begrudgingly that she's not the best with moon magic, making her and the other winks appear as the keepers. And so, while Aisha flees Tritanus and their mutated family, trying to get Nyssa, Lemmy, and Phila out of the city, the other winks battle the tricks. Aisha manages to buy Nyssa enough time to get Phila and Lemmy out of the city to safety, and she manages to hold her own against Tritanus. He attempts to mutate her as well, but her Believix therapeutic powers seem to ward off the corruption, keeping her safe. Frustrated, Tritanus simply sicks their family on her, and right on time, a new specialist arrives to help. He introduces himself as Roy, a leading specialist on Andros who is asked specifically by Aisha's parents to keep her safe. Roy's aggressiveness when fighting Aisha's extended family, however, upsets her. Deciding to give it a go, Aisha attempts to use her fairy dust, mingled with her therapeutic powers, on Tressa, which manages to not only heal her, but ward off the relapse Timmy described happened to the Red Fountain test subjects. When Tritanus attempts to mutate her again, Tressa is incapacitated for a few moments, but this time she resists the corruption altogether. Terrified, Tritanus orders his forces to withdraw, and Darcy allows them all to escape. The Winks celebrate their discovery as well as Tressa's liberation, and for once, it appears there might be a way to stop Tritanus in his tracks. Nyssa, meanwhile, leads Lemmy and Phila to the other Keepers, only for the tricks to appear, revealing that Darcy had placed a tracing spell on the injured Selkies. Tritanus corners them, absorbing all of their powers at once, meaning he now has access to all the ocean gates of the magical universe. We begin the episode with Tecna, Aisha, and Flora leading a group of Elfia students, including Roxy, through an exercise in navigating Black Mud Swamp. Unfortunately for Aisha, however, Roy is here insisting to keep an eye on her, not taking a damn hint that Aisha just kinda wants to be trusted to handle herself and allowed to focus on her responsibilities. Of course, Roxy is excelling with her team's navigation, whereas Crystal is purposefully dragging her feet, pressuring the others to do so as well. Flora checks in to see what the issue is, commending Roxy only to be called out by Crystal for showing favoritism, especially when Tecna made it clear that the supervisors weren't going to be helping or communicating with the students at any point until they finished. Tecna attempts to step in and, frustrated, calls it early on the assignment and tells the students that the next time they attempt this they'll need to learn to harmonize, to which Crystal and some other students mockingly joke about the heartless robot knowing anything about harmony. The three return and head right for the teacher's lounge where we get some cute interactions with the Winks along with their old professors, whether they were ever this bad, to which they respond, yeah, we just learned to inspire enough fear to knock it out of y'all from day one. The light atmosphere dissipates, however, when Farragona calls a staff meeting where she, along with Roxy and Concorda, reveal that the ancestral witches have returned and attempted to seek out information on Cyrenix in the Magic Archive. Everyone is immediately mortified, and Farragonda surmises that somehow the witches survived the destruction of Obsidian, and with their prison obliterated, their spirits were free to seek out the tricks, and they've been pulling the strings ever since. They were the ones who caused the oil spill 
killing Gardenia, who corrupted the pollution, and who turned Tritanus into the monster he is now. Bloom also posits that Skye must have seen them on the rig, and that's why they cursed him with his current condition. It's clear now that the ancestral witches are seeking out the power of Cyrenix, and the Winx must find it first and permanently destroy its source to keep it out of the witch's reach. Tecna summons the Book of Fairies, admitting she's had no luck deciphering the new page's information. It isn't even a riddle, but rather a strange series of symbols that she can't make sense of. Flora, however, seems to recognize the pattern at least. The symbols are from an ancient language used on Delona, a world where emotions take mystical form. Thankfully, they happen to know a recently graduated guardian fairy there. We get Murda, a now guardian fairy of Delona, on a video call where she easily breaks down the passage with her emotive powers, revealing that to understand this language, you must form an empathic connection with the person who wrote the original passage, which Tecna does not grasp well at all. Murda, however, reveals it to be a series of coordinates. Before she goes, she asks the Winx how they're doing, as she's been worried about them given all the bad press around them. She tries to encourage them, saying that if anyone can stop the tricks, it's them. But, uh, the Winx are currently in panic mode right now, so... After analyzing the coordinates, Tecna finds that they lead to the long-abandoned Databridge Castle, found in the forbidden quadrant of the Ionic Sea on Zenith. In ancient times, a cruel and apathetic emperor attempted to conquer Zenith, but was said to have been punished for his cruelty by the sea itself, which swallowed his castle. The Winx surmise that the Cyrenix quest is likely bringing them to each of their homeworlds, and Tecna's is the next stop, which has Tecna incredibly anxious. Meanwhile, Farragonda, having notified the other members of the Company of Light about the Ancestral Witch's return, meets with them, along with nearly all the rulers of the Magical Universe, on Domino to discuss their next move. Of course, Venomia is here to try and figure out why the nobles are having a secret gathering, but they simply lock her out. Though it's clear that she is not leaving without an answer, and her intentions are far from pure. The Winx arrive on Zenith, where Riven, Timmy, Helia, and even Roy plan to join the Winx on their mission this time. Once they descend, however, they come across the Ocean Gate, where the Keeper Lithia is resting. It's here that they learn that Tritanus had deceived them, and now he's able to enter all the oceans of the Magical Universe, making the threat he poses even graver. Tritanus, meanwhile, has set up shop again back in the city of Tritons. With his new abilities, he's able to hold omnipotence over all the oceans, making tracking the Winx and anyone else even easier. Tressa, however, seems to be hiding out on land as he can't sense her. Frustrated, he takes his anger out on the castle's infrastructure itself and stops when he finds an old trident he used for sparring in his youth. It's during this moment Tritanus kind of breaks down, revealing that he always felt feared by his own family and how he was always a monster to them. Icy doesn't really know what to say, but she felt similar in her youth given her parents and even younger sister always feared her preference for dark magic. This confuses Tritanus for a bit, but Icy clarifies that Darcy and Stormy are her sisters in terms of their coven, but they're not her birth family. Before Icy can say anything further, Tritanus senses the wings on Zenith, and in a weirdly flirtatious manner, he asks Icy if she's up to tear off their wings to let off some steam, which does bring a smile to Icy's face, because of course it does. Back on Domino, meanwhile, the summit continues. Oratel makes the announcement, and immediately, the rulers all shit themselves in terror, especially Arendor. Once it's revealed that they are the ones behind the return of the Trix and Tritanus rise to power, Everyone disagrees on what to do, with most of the kingdoms wanting to focus on just protecting themselves. Oratel specifically begs Arendor to stay and help them fight the witches together like old times, but this upsets Arendor even further, and refusing to explain himself, he simply says he'll never be able to apologize enough, nor forgive himself before leaving. Venomia, of course, tries to get a word from every single noble as they leave, only getting a lucky break when she appeals to Crystal's distaste of the Winx. In the meantime, the Winx arrive at Databridge Castle. They find it quiet and empty, but disturbingly intact and somewhat still functional. Once they head inside, however, the doors close behind them and the ancestral witches reveal themselves. They mock the fairies' efforts of fighting them, though when they try to possess the Winx like they did in the movie, the attempts fail, as it seems the ancestral spirit of nature's boon protects them. The witches do, however, possess Riven, Timmy, and Helia, making Tecna specifically hesitate in the midst of battle. They also mention Daphne being a no-good liar, which specifically messes with Bloom's head. Without warning, the witches retreat and free the specialists, only for Tritanus, his army, and the tricks to arrive. And so, while Timmy and Tecna head deeper into the castle to find the next gem, the others do 
their best to hold off Tritanus' forces. The Winx try to warn Tritanus that he's being used, but he refuses to listen, and the tricks give the fairies no time to try and use their powers to free any of the mutants. Techno and Timmy arrive at the Emperor's throne room, where his skeleton, still clad in his techno-magic armor, sits in his throne, surrounded by strange thorny vines. As they approach, a data barrier surrounds them, and the Emperor's armor comes to life and seems to animate the skeleton. Timmy tries to fight him, only to be pricked by one of the thorns, turning him incredibly aggressive towards Tecna. Tecna refuses to fight back and manages to trap Timmy in a laser net and uses her fairy dust and therapeutic powers to free him. She then turns this power on the Emperor's suit, which corrodes his magical influence and disables the systems around the castle. It's here that the Gem of Compassion reveals itself to Tecna. Newly empowered, Tecna aids in the fight and, content with their success, the Winx use Zoomix to teleport themselves back to Elfia. They can't celebrate, however, as Bloom is terrified for Daphne. They rush to Lake Rockaluce and use their Tracix wings to visualize the past, which allows them to see the ancestral witches capturing Daphne. Horrified and realizing why Daphne hadn't answered her the last time she was there, Bloom just breaks down crying. We begin with some coverage of the Ancestral Witch's return from Venomia on its magics. Specifically, she harps on the sovereigns of the magical universe for attempting to keep this a secret, and especially the Winx for supposedly lying about their triumph. Zoom out to reveal that this broadcast is being watched everywhere in the city of Harmonia on Melody. On jumbotrons, on TVs through windows, even on people's phones. People are so freaked out and upset that they're constantly looking over their shoulders. And since Melody is all about music and harmony, the weather is going nuts, and you can actually hear that the world is out of tune. Cut to just outside the city, where Musa, Tecna, and Riven are visiting Musa's father, Oboe, in her childhood home. Yes, his name is Oboe for the instrument, but it's, it's spelled like this. Don't... I didn't... <sighs> Whatever. Located right next to Songbird Bay. Tecna is trying to piece together the next part of the riddle with Oboe's musical expertise, as this time the riddle seems to have been communicated through an incredibly complicated series of music sheets. I'm having war flashbacks. I had to play the flute in elementary school. Well, I didn't have to. I, I chose it for myself, and I regretted it. Musa and Riven, meanwhile, try to keep a low profile and catch up, given they haven't been able to spend much time together. Musa's not feeling all that great, as given she's a guardian fairy of Melody, her homeworld being so out of balance is having negative effects on her as well. Riven tries to comfort her, mentioning he has a surprise, but that she's probably figured it out, that she hasn't actually. You see, normally Musa is able to hear the secret song in people's hearts, but given she and her powers are out of whack right now, she can't, so at the very least, Riven's surprise remains unheard. Meanwhile, on Domino, Bloom heads to the Mountain of the Rock with Oratel, and she's here to ask Bartleby whether the Book of Fate mentions anything to do with the current crisis or Sky's destiny. And unfortunately, while Bartleby can't tell her what exactly will happen, he does give a dark prophecy that while Bloom and Sky will restore peace to the magical universe together, their stories are destined to diverge from that point. Unsure of what even to make of this, Bloom simply leaves, and Oratel feels helpless in his inability to console her. Tritanus, in the meantime, is growing far more agitated. Icy suggests that perhaps Tritanus needs to become stronger, and agreeing, Tritanus decides to head to Earth to find more pollution, which he can infuse with dark magic. And while he does this, he sends the tricks to spy on the Winx in the hopes that they might be able to discover how to obtain Cyrenix before them. Cut to Gardenia, where Mike and Vanessa are about to sit for dinner till they get a knock at the door. Enter Oratel and Miriam, who are looking for advice on how to help Bloom, especially given they haven't had time since Domino was restored to sit down and truly bond as a family. And right on time, Mike has VHS tapes of all their best memories. Oratel and Miriam are on for a goddamn ride Earth style. Back on Melody, Musa and Riven are trying to have an inconspicuous date to kill time when they get a text from Tecna that she's cracked the code. As they head back, who else takes notice of them other than the infamous Venomia watching from afar? 
They get to the house where Obo plays the full melody, and Musa immediately recognizes it as a melody often passed down in lullabies on melody, which her mother Wanin altered to create the song Like a Ruby. Musa surmises that the Sirenix quest is pointing them to the Ruby Reef, which isn't too far from Songbird Bay. Before they can leave, however, an angry crowd is gathered outside demanding answers from the Winx, led by Venomia herself. Riven angrily tries to defend Musa, but Musa is growing exasperated. Even when the other Winx arrive after getting word from Tecna, things actually get a lot worse, as the Trick sees the moment to launch a surprise attack and stoke the people's fears and distrust. Musa tries to take a stand, but Darcy makes a note at the advisement of Listless, her direct ancestress, to try and wedge a divide between Musa and Riven. Stormy, meanwhile, is advised by Tharma to actually destroy the house while Musa's father is in it. She lays waste to it, but Riven and the Winx manage to save Obo, only to realize all the memorabilia and songs from Wanin have now been destroyed. This really drives Musa up the wall, and with her heart out of balance, the ancestral witches take the opportunity to curse her, transforming her into a horrible monster, which they send to destroy the Ruby Reef before the Winx can get there. When the Tricks take issue with this, that's when Belladonna, the leader of the ancestral witches, reveals that she swiped the Book of Fairies when she had the chance. The group splits up. While Riven, Aisha, and Tecna go after Musa, the others battle the Trix and Ancestral Witches. The crowd is only further upset, but that's when the Winx get an idea. The combination of their fairy dust and therapeutic powers, they're able to calm the people and even harm the Ancestral Witches who retreat. The Winx take this moment to attack the Trix unexpectedly, swiping back the Book of Fairies. In the scene, meanwhile, Aisha manages to temporarily trap the transformed Musa, but Tecna finds her fairy dust unable to fully break the spell on Musa. Riven then gets the idea to try and sing his song to her, which does manage to catch her attention, but she unfortunately goes into a rage and breaks free again. The others catch up, and Riven and Tecna hatch a plan. At the Ruby Reef, the Winx trap Musa again, this time using their fairy dust and therapeutic powers all at once, and in perfect harmony to Riven's song. This manages to be enough to free Musa this time, and once everyone takes a collective sigh of relief, Musa and Riven play the melody of Like a Ruby on the Coral Harp at the heart of the reef. Musa allows herself to grieve, but asserts that so long as she has her memories of her mother, she can always move forward, and this is how she earns the Gem of Grace. Once they return to Harmonia, the Winx and Riven are greeted by King Requios, Queen Symphia, and Princess Galatea, who thank them for restoring hope and balance to Melody. Right on time, of course, Oratel, Miriam, Mike, and Vanessa arrive, as Oratel had panicked hearing the news update about the Ancestral Witch's attack. With everything fine, Musa and Riven perform Riven's song One to One, and once Bloom talks with Oratel and Miriam a bit, she agrees they should spend some time together in the near future, along with time including Mike and Vanessa, given they're all a family now. While things look good for the Winx right now, Tritanus arrives in the Pacific Garbage Vortex on Earth, where he looks forward to becoming even stronger and possibly expanding his forces. Walls are coming down to the sound of her melody, D. We begin on the island of Tirnenog, the stronghold of the terrestrial fairies ruled by Nebula. Nebula is going through reports of new magical creatures appearing across Earth, while also trying to formulate a plan to tackle all the people across the world who are suddenly displaying magical powers, be they wizards, fairies, or witches. That's when they get an emergency message from Cordelia, the major fairy of the sea, that Tritanus has launched an attack and is causing havoc in the Pacific Ocean. Putting her plans on hold, Nebula prepares to head out and meet with Cordelia to stop Tritanus herself. She also has two messengers go out, one to get help from Diana, the major fairy of nature, and one to the magical universe to ask for help. Meanwhile, the Winx lead a supervised trip of students to Pixie Village. The Pixies are happy to finally be reunited with their fairies, though Chatta in particular acts very cold towards Flora and, despite being the Pixie of Gossip, refuses to speak. Roxy, meanwhile, has no luck in bonding with any of the Pixies. Meanwhile, Crystal bonds with Sherry, the Pixie of Weather who is incredibly hot-headed and rash. Roxy wanders off and in the process meets and bonds with Zing, the cosplaying Pixie of Arthropods. Yes, arthropods. That includes all bugs, both insects and arachnids, and if you say that she's the pixie of insects, she will cut you. They have to return to Ophia immediately, however, at Griselda's request, and the pixies decide to go with the Winx in case they can help. Farragonda informs the Winx of Tritanus' current attack on Earth, prompting the Winx to re-examine their next steps on the Serenix quest. They've been struggling since they've hit a dead end with the next riddle. They're certain that of the remaining planets, the next one will be Flora's world of Linfea, and at first the riddle seemed easy with depictions of land flowers, 
but Flora can't make sense when stringing their meanings together, and has been beating herself up over wasting time before the end of the lunar cycle, which they're nearing the halfway point of. And so, while Flora and Tecna remain at Alfea to try and decipher the riddle, the other Winx and Roxy head to Earth to help in the fight against Tritanus. The Pixies, save for Digit and begrudgingly Chatta, prepare to head back to Pixie Village. Musa calls Riven to ask him, Timmy, and Helia for help, but Toon actually gives her the idea to have Helia come to Alfea to help Flora with the riddle somehow. Flora decides to ask Princess Crystal for input, but Crystal is simply passive aggressive and despite having nothing to offer, takes shots at Flora for not being the confident guardian fairy her mother had always viewed her as. This does prompt Shadda to actually speak, but only disappointedly that Flora couldn't even stand her ground. On Earth, meanwhile, Tritanus continues gaining power from the garbage vortex. I've never seen so much garbage. It's perfect! Creating dark storms and tidal waves in his wake. But thankfully, Nebula, Diana, and Cordelia arrive with their forces to put up a fight against his army, and the Winx and Roxy arrive as well. Flora returns to the dorm where she finds Helia looking over the Book of Fairies with Tecna. Flora tries to compose herself, but Helia reassures her that she's strong and she just needs to have faith in herself. He decides to help her take her mind off things. After all, whenever he has a creative block for his poems, he usually finds it best to take a step back and re-examine his approach. He asks Flora if she's tried doing origami lately, and Flora admits that she hasn't had time for it in months. She finds it incredibly relaxing, especially as she follows Healy's lead, but that's when she gets a random idea. She rushes to the Book of Fairies, rips out the page with the flower riddles, and follows her instincts as she folds it up into a sea anemone. When she finishes, the paper floats into the air and transforms into a strange jellyfish-type creature which sparkles with light. Flora realizes that this is a jovial Snydarian. Is that pronunciation correct? I don't know. A rare creature in the Ocean of Flowers on Linfea, which is essentially a hybrid between an anemone and a jellyfish. But despite emitting a dazzling light when they swim, they have not been seen in centuries. Somehow, this creature is related to the Sirenix quest, and so Flora, Tecna, and Helia, along with Digit and Chatta, head for Linfea. Unluckily for them, however, Darcy is watching them through an advanced spying spell they got from Listless and the tricks head for Linfea while the Ancestral Witches resume their torturing of Daphne. They know they're unlikely to get any answers from her anytime soon, but hey, they're beings of darkness. They get a sick kick from torture. Back on Earth, the battle continues. The Winx do their best to free the mutants with their powers, but can only free one at a time and find the process exhausting. Roxy, meanwhile, has been keeping any marine life away from Tritanus as best she can, but hoping to prove more useful, she attempts to make contact with the Kraken. Of course, that attempt fails, and when Tritanus catches on, he targets her, which forces Nebula to bail her out of danger. It's here that the Winx notice a cruise ship under threat from Tritanus monsters, and some of the people on the ship recognize the Winx, but are slightly confused, given they're more used to the girl's Believix forms. This, however, gives Stella an idea. Humoring her, the Winx transform into Believix and start a convergence spell, focusing on channeling the belief everyone on Earth has for them, and this manages to free a decent chunk of Tritanus' army from his control. Content with the power he's gained and assuming a larger, more hideous mutated form, Tritanus opens the ocean gates and, after creating a massive water spout of pollution to distract the fairies, he and his forces escape. The Wings manage to calm the weather with Cordelia's help, but it's clear that the battle has been lost, and it's very likely Tritanus will at some point return for more of Earth's pollution. On Linfea, meanwhile, Flora, Tecna, Helia, Chatta, and Digit descend into the Ocean of Flowers, heading for one of its more dangerous, less explored areas known as the Poison Valley. Because, you know, all the poisonous shit lives here. Oh, and also all the carnivorous shit. How wild could a flower be? Carnivorous. They'll eat you. Oh. oh. This area is also known for its abundance of wild magic, a dark form of natural magic that corrupts fauna and flora, similar to what Tritanus does with his pollution. Of course, Flora is kinda anxious since this part of the quest is basically riding on her. In the distance, luckily, they spot a jellyfish-like creature, and Flora, at Chatta's behest, rushes towards it. But before Helia, Tecna, and Digit can follow, they're cut off by a wall of shadows, and shortly thereafter confronted by Icy and Stormy. Flora, meanwhile, approaches the jellyfish, only to find it emitting darkness rather than light. The creature explodes, and the darkness surrounds Flora and Chatta. Immediately, Flora starts seeing hallucinations of the other Winx and Helia mocking her for her weakness. However, she notices an oddity when she sees a hallucination of Chatta mocking her, while the actual Chatta lies there crying behind her. Reaching out, Flora asks Chatta to take her hand, and when she does, their bond is able to break through the dark magic, 
revealing Darcy playing the puppeteer as usual. Wanting nothing more than to help her friends, especially when Darcy goes after Chata, Flora taps into her true power, and is able to force the Tricks to retreat as she connects to all the nearby plants and harnesses their power. Everyone reunites, and because of Flora's power, the true creatures they've been looking for reveal themselves, having been hiding this whole time. Flora and Chata finally have a conversation, and Chata admits that she could feel Flora's dwindling confidence through their bond, and she thought maybe giving her the cold shoulder might help Flora stand up for herself, only for it to create a rift between them, resulting in Chata seeing a hallucination of Flora surrendering and letting the tricks uh, kill her. Yeah. With their bond fully restored and Flora confident in herself and her friends again, she receives the gem of faith. On Tyr Nadog, meanwhile, while the Winx are happy to get this news, Nebula is still concerned about Tritanus. And so she, at Roxy's suggestion, decides to meet with the Sovereigns of the Magical Universe for a potential alliance. We begin on Solaria, where the Winx, save for Bloom and Aisha, are looking for clues as to the next riddle from the Book of Fairies, mostly by going through everything they can get from the archives on anything to do with the royal depths of the Azure Valley. Radius is preparing to head out for a summit on Domino, which he's not exactly excited for. Stella can't go given she has to prove herself next for the Cyrenics quest, but she's kind of relieved, but she's kind of relieved she'll be absent from any politicking. Yes, that is, that's actually a term that she uses. Let's get politicking! Bloom, meanwhile, is with Ortel and Miriam, while Aisha is with her parents and cousin Tressa as the leaders of the magical universe, at least the few that bother to show up, gather in Ortel and Miriam's palace. Present also are Nebula, Cordelia, and Roxy from Earth, as well as Erendor, Samara, and Sky of Arachleon. Erendor is hoping that given the improvements in Sky's health, he might be up to this meeting, but his amnesia is showing no signs of disappearing. And of course, this only further disheartens Bloom. That's when Lockett suggests an idea. Given she's the pixie of direction and Pith is the pixie of sweet dreams, they might be able to work together to help Sky find himself again. Reluctantly, Erendor and Samara agree, and so while Bloom and Miriam go with the pixies to help Sky with the healing process, the others remain to discuss the matter of Tritanus, the tricks, and most pressingly, the ancestral witches. Back on Solaria, as the sun is setting, the other Winks are having absolutely no luck. They've been assuming that they need some light source to reveal the riddle within the Book of Fairies, but have had no luck. Not with natural sunlight, not with any weird prisms Techna uses to create lights of different colors, not even with Stella's powers or the second son of Solaria. And everyone just kind of decides to come back to the issue the next day. Especially when Brandon arrives and Stella, with everyone's okay, decides to go out with him for food. Over on Domino's, Sky is nervous to start the healing process, but Miriam helps to comfort him, given she's one of the best healers in the magical universe. So while Pith keeps Sky peacefully asleep, Miriam guides Bloom as they use their powers to keep any residual dark magic in Sky's mind at bay, and Laquette tries to find the root of the ancestral witch's curse so they can eliminate it. Brandon and Stella, meanwhile, go out to eat and very much enjoy their time together given Brandon has been so busy on Arachleon trying to help take care of Sky. He's incredibly stressed and feels especially guilty not being around for Stella, but Stella is surprisingly mature about all of this. She knows that Brandon is doing his best and she's proud of him. She actually kind of relates, saying that she wishes she'd been able to help Bloom cope with the situation more. They're both suddenly taken aback by the sight of the full moon, however, which which makes Stella feel a bit more somber. When the moonlight causes part of the sea, as well as the crystals in the sea, to sparkle, however, Stella rushes back to the palace and Brandon follows. She grabs the Book of Fairies and exposes it to the moonlight. The pages begin to glow, but still nothing. It isn't until Stella, albeit hesitantly, uses her lunar powers, which creates a holographic projection of the seas of Solaria. And Tecna pinpoints a location where the light is brightest, the Azure Valley. Unfortunately, the stomach is not going great. While the rulers of Andros and Melody are on board for an alliance with Domino and the Terrestrial Fairies, Arachleon and Solaria, the only other royals who have bothered to make an appearance, insist that each kingdom defends itself. This especially frustrates Aisha, Roxy, and Tressa. We cut back to the Azure Valley where the Winx and Brandon dive in, believing they can only accomplish this task in the light of the full moon. Tecna scans the valley and notices irregularities between what her sensors are picking up versus what's in front of them. Stella manages to dispel the magical crystals around them, which are warping the space with illusion magic. 
Turns out lunar magic deals heavily in illusions, which Stella is not a big fan of. Diving further, they find an ancient ruin, which Tecna finds to be called the Royal Depths. As they go in further, Stella recognizes some of the statues, and especially the crescent emblems everywhere, as figures and symbols from Salarian history, back when there were two kingdoms, one of the sun and one of the moon. Out of the blue, they're attacked by shadow eels that emit darkness. Stella tries to use her regular solar powers only to nearly blind everyone and set off ancient traps within the ruins, separating them all. Stella finds herself alone, hearing strange ethereal voices of fear, sorrow, and pain. Using her Tracex wings, she discovers that this temple was once on the surface, but was submerged shortly after her planet's unification by Thea, then Queen of Salaria. The sight disturbs Stella, and recalling her struggles to channel her emotions to use her moon powers, especially after her parents' divorce, she allows herself to feel her grief, strengthening her moon powers, and filling the temple with moonlight, destroying the shadow eels and allowing everyone to reunite. Stella isn't presented with a gem, however, but while the others are confused and worried, Stella is certain that she knows what to do. Back on Domino, while Bloom and Miriam have been able to physically heal Sky, his amnesia still remains, as the dark magic fueling his memory loss is still too powerful. And Lockett affirms that even if it were completely removed, the damage is irreversible. We head back to the summit, where things are even more tenuous, with vehement debates over what to do. Stella then busts in and roasts the isolationist kingdom before revealing the ruins of, according to Tecna's research, the Kingdom of Selenia, which was based on, you guessed it, people whose powers were rooted in the moon as well as the other stars of the night sky. Radius actually doesn't know about this temple's existence himself, but is too shocked and ashamed to acknowledge what Stella is saying, and he simply storms out. Though the summit is a failure, Stella assures the hopes of those in favor of the Alliance that things can change for the better, and it is here that she receives the Gem of Hope. Though right now she's not sure what to do with the information about Selenia's destruction at the hands of Solaria's past rulers, she is determined to find a way to make it right, especially once she becomes Queen of Salaria. While things are looking somewhat better for our heroes, however, Tritanus is simply biding his time and rebuilding his lost forces on Andros. While the Trix plan to visit Domino not only to confront the Winx, but also to learn about Cyrenix from Daphne's old friend, Politea. We begin in the depths of the Oceans of Domino, in the locale called Geyser Gorge, which, you guessed it, is filled with underwater geysers. It's a rather dangerous location, and hiding out here is the water dragon we saw all the way back in Episode 2. Up above, meanwhile, the Winks are at the Royal Palace for the Ceremony of Revival, a celebration of the anniversary of the world's liberation from the Ancestral Witch's Curse. Arendor and Samara are here with Skye, given it was Skye who freed Oratel's sword to help free the world. And though it's clear his parents are uncomfortable, Skye himself seems happy to be here. Not sure how much he understands this, though. Bloom manages to get a brief moment to talk with Skye, though when Skye expresses his sorrow that he isn't the hero everyone remembers him as, and that he probably won't even remember this conversation given enough time, Bloom emphasizes that no matter what, he'll always be a hero to her through his kindness and courage. Things get a bit tense, however, when an unexpected visitor arrives at the palace. Diospro, a former noble from Arachleon who has been staying at Light Rock Monastery following her banishment. Everyone is shocked, and though Oratel and Miriam don't know her, Oratel orders the guards to surround her at Bloom's request, no questions asked. Diospro, however, apologizes for her sudden appearance and simply wanted to give her condolences to Bloom and see how her old friend Skye was. Flora convinces Bloom to give Diospro a chance, especially considering how long she has spent at Light Rock, and that she's only arrived just now. Bloom allows this, and when Diospro sees what's become of Skye, she tears up a bit, but is at least relieved to see that he's happy and doing well. With this, Diospro is content and returns to the monastery, giving Bloom pause given how distrustful she is of Diospro given her past actions. With that over with, and once Skye is certain he can handle the ceremony himself, the Winks ask for Miriam's help with the Book of Fairies' next riddle. Whenever they open the book to its new page, it spews forth fire, and Miriam immediately connects this to Geyser Gorge, an old favorite diving spot of hers, because 
Well, Miriam was a bit of a thrill seeker in her youth, much to Ortil's dismay while trying to woo her. And so the winks head off, which delights the ancestral witches who are keeping to the shadows and observing from afar. The winks find the gorge to be incredibly unstable. Underwater geysers erupt almost constantly with, oddly enough, yellow magical flames that the water can't extinguish. Techna researches mythology around the gorge and finds that the gorge is said to contain the remains of the great dragon's resentment for the Leviathan. Reminder, Leviathan is the, the water star deity, you know, like, mm. Bloom attempts to use her powers to control the fire, but that only makes the matters worse as the gorge experiences a massive tremor. In their rush to find cover, Bloom and Stella wind up trapped in an underwater cave system running through the gorge, and the other winks are immediately confronted by the Trix, who have been lying in wait. Things aren't going that well on the land either, as right before Sky can wield Oratel's old sword, the one he freed from Obsidian, the Ancestral Witches launch their attack, revealing themselves to be holding Daphne's spirit hostage. They've decided to hold Daphne's entire family hostage to force information about Cyrenix out of her, but Ortel and Miriam aren't going down without a fucking fight. Ortel busts out his brand new sword, which he's been dying to test out, while Skye takes Ortel's old sword to join the fight. Back in the caverns beneath the gorge, Bloom relents her causing the geysers to go out of control, as though she doesn't fully understand the nature of her own power and fears what might happen if it were to go out of control. Especially if they were to have to enter the infinite ocean, which was created by the power that nearly destroyed her through the water stars. It's Stella, though, who manages to somewhat reassure Bloom. Especially given she's not sure any of the Winks fully understand their own powers, but they're doing their best. As they go deeper, however, they come across the lair of the water dragon from earlier. The dragon glares at them, focusing on Bloom as though it somehow knows her personally. The fight outside quickly draws their attention as the water dragon rushes to escape and essentially makes its own exit. The Trix attempt to capture the beast, but Bloom instinctively comes to its rescue, allowing it to disappear into the distance. A brief fight ensues, but when Icy makes a comment about Bloom's family, she gets terrified, and the Winx use their Zoomix wings to teleport away. The Trix, however, are terrified of what the Ancestral Witches will say, given that they let the dragon escape. Back at the palace, the Ancestral Witches manage to capture Oratel and Miriam. Daphne admits that the Cyrenic source is in her cave in Lake Rockaluce, but the power can only be wielded by those who are deemed worthy. Otherwise, those who pursue it will be struck by the Cyrenic's curse. Still, the Ancestral Witches finally have the information that they need. Right on time, the Winx arrive to free Oratel and Miriam. The Witches target Sky, but with Bloom's help, he manages to wield the full power of Oratel's sword, and together they chase off the Ancestral Witches and free Daphne. Bloom tries to return Daphne's mask to her, but Daphne insists that Bloom keep it. With that, Daphne fades, returning to the depths of Lake Rockaluce to rest and further protect the Cyrenic source. Things aren't looking all that great, cause um, uh, Bloom does not have her gem, and without that, the Winx still cannot earn Cyrenix. Once the Trix update the Ancestral Witches back in Shadowhaunt, Though the witches mock their descendants, they pay no mind to their failure. They now know where to find Cyrenix and plan on creating a spell to corrupt the power and take it by force, circumventing the Cyrenix curse. The mention of which makes the Trix very worried, and reasonably so. The witches, however, insist that the Trix will be fine, as they've learned from their last attempt of corrupting a Cyrenix fairy. Politeia. We begin in Lake Rockaluce, where Daphne is still resting and keeping an eye out for the Ancestral Witches. She's honestly relieved Bloom isn't worthy of earning Cyrenix, given how the last time someone tried to take that power from the source, it resulted in her old friend and former fellow nymph Politeia being transformed into a horrible abomination. At Alfia, meanwhile, the Winx thankfully now know the Cyrenic source is in Lake Rockaluce, but they're still unable to access it without Bloom receiving her gem. Musa posits that their original goal was simply to safeguard the power from the Trix, so now they should be able to do just that so long as they keep an eye on the source. Still, Bloom is fraught with distress and self-doubt. There's also the time bomb factor, given the lunar cycle ends in less than a week, and after that, the Winx's powers will be sealed away forever. The Trix speak to Tritanus in inform him of their discovery. Tritanus could march into Lake Rockaluce himself, but this would not only draw the attention of the Winx and the staff at Alfia, 
but it would also endanger him from falling victim to the Sirenic's curse. The Trix, however, claim that they found a way to make a spell to circumvent the curse. Asking Tritanus whether he trusts her, Icy convinces Tritanus to let her handle the matter, and together they'll open the door to the Infinite Ocean and conquer the magical universe together. Venomia, of course, pays a visit to check in on the Winx Club's progress, further instilling anxiety and doubt in Bloom. And oddly, Venomia's resentment of the Winx, and especially Bloom, seems rather personal, as though she's known them for longer than she's letting on. Sky arrives to pay Bloom an unexpected visit, with Brandon to help ensure his safety, and begrudgingly, Venomia leaves. Though Sky can't fully recall the details of his last conversation with Bloom, he does remember her face and name, and that she brought out the best in him. He asks Bloom what's wrong, and when Bloom admits her doubt in herself, Sky tries to comfort her, only for Bloom to instinctively go in for a kiss, then stop herself and apologize profusely, seeing how uncomfortable she's made Sky. Sky heads back to Arachleon with Brandon, while Stella fetches Bloom with a new discovery about Sirenix. The Winx are gathered in the Magic Archive with Farragonda Griselda and, at her insistent request, Roxy. And Seer Concorda reads an old legend that she's uncovered about the first fairy to ever wield Sirenix, Roccaluce. Note, Jeremy actually pitched this one, so uh, everyone thank my friend Jeremy. According to the legend, every Sirenix fairy is given one wish when she pleases fate. Roccaluce attempted to use this wish to resurrect her lover who had died at sea. However, once he was returned to life, he experienced a strange, constant sorrow and pain in his heart, and mysterious tragedies began to occur all around them, escalating quickly until it became clear the Sirenix curse was punishing Roccaluce for breaking one of the universe's major taboos. And so, she allowed her lover to pass into the afterlife while she became a ghost trapped in the realm of oblivion, imprisoned by her own bitterness and resentment. The story doesn't give them any clues on how to proceed, but does make it clear that the power of Sirenix has many strings attached, including a terrible curse should it be used for ill. Before they can even fully process this information, Bloom receives a psychic warning through Daphne's mask. Once she dons it, she can see Daphne fighting the ancestral witches and the tricks in Lake Roccaluce, and she is losing very badly. Sky and Brandon, meanwhile, have returned to Arachleon. They told Arendor they were simply heading to Red Fountain to hang with the other specialists, but Arendor discovers from Venomia's social media that Sky was visiting Bloom strictly against Arendor's orders. Sky sticks up for himself, and Arendor admits that there is a reason he has never liked the idea of Sky and Bloom being together. Not because he resents Bloom, but rather because of a crime of his own against not only Oratel and Miriam, but all of Domino long ago. Cue the cool sequence from Magical Adventure where Arendor reveals a large mosaic hidden in the walls of his throne room, depicting what Brandon refers to as the Forbidden City of Avram. A compartment opens up containing a scroll, which Arendor hands to Sky and Brandon, and once they begin reading, they are mortified. Back on Magics, the Winx rush to help Daphne. Bloom helps her sister in fighting the ancestral witches while the other Winx battle the tricks. And Bloom even becomes one with her sister like she did in The Secret of the Lost Kingdom. A problem arises, however, as the ancestral witches mention their spell on Sky. Bloom comes close to destroying the witches, but the witches reveal that if they were to be eradicated, the remnants of their dark magic in Sky's mind would release a backlash, killing him. Daphne tells Bloom to finish the witches off, whether they're lying or not, but Bloom can't bring herself to, and the witches take advantage of her hesitation to knock her aside, while weakening Daphne enough to force her to dissipate to recharge her powers. The ancestral witches help the tricks knock back the winks, and the tricks use the witch's new incantation, and using the vacuum spell with the Whispering Crystals from Season 1, because the term Whispering Crystals is cool as fuck, thank you for one thing, 4Kids dub, to corrupt the Sirenic source and rip the power out of it, allowing them to attain the power of, as they call it, Dark Sirenics all while avoiding the Sirenix curse. The Book of Fairies manifests and a mysterious female voice bursts forth, declaring the Winx unworthy of Sirenix, and thus their powers are sealed away. They rush back to the surface before they run out of breath, and there, waiting for them, are Venomia and her news crew ready to grill the Winx on their apparent failure. The Tricks, meanwhile, relish in their new dark Sirenix powers. The Ancestral Witch's first order is to take out Tritanus, but still having feelings for him, Icy insists that they can still use his army and powers to their advantage. Toying with the idea, the witches agree, and so the Tricks meet with Tritanus on Andros to show off their new powers. At Tritanus' request, the Tricks open a gate to the Infinite Ocean, and the episode ends with us getting our first view of the dimension as Tritanus' forces invade, ready to conquer all the secrets it has to offer. Also, I should note, we're not doing the whole dimension of CGI thing, so the Infinite Ocean is 2D. But in terms of design, that is not yet ironed out, because... Well, this is a dumb glorified fan fiction, but the point is that 
things are looking bad for everyone. We begin at Light Rock Monastery, where the Winks are essentially on trial for failing the Sirenix quest and effectively handing the power over to the Ancestral Witches. Yay! Oh dear. Also present for the trial are Farragonda, Griffin, Saladin, Oratel, and Miriam, as former members of the Company of Light trying to come to the Winx's defense, along with Roxy because she refused to be excluded from plot. Bloom is racked with guilt for causing the Winx to fail, but while the other Winx do understand why she couldn't bring herself to stop the Ancestral Witches, they also know that now the entire magical universe is at stake as a result, causing a rift in the group. Bloom speaks up that she is the one to blame for what's happened before the Council and she pleads guilty, but asks that the other Winx be pardoned, which the Council agrees to. In the Infinite Ocean, meanwhile, Tritanus and the Trix are heading to what Tritanus refers to as the darkest part of the sea, the Emperor's Throne. The throne stands tall, high above a vast abyss stretching out past the horizon, and supposedly whoever claims it will possess absolute power over this realm and, in effect, the magical universe. Upon this attempt, however, the throne stands idle, even sending Tritanus falling face first a few dozen feet while he tries to forcibly activate it with his trident. What's wrong with this thing? Aggravated, the Ancestral Witches reveal themselves as having strung Tritanus along. Icy freezes up, unsure of what to say or do, but once Darcy and Stormy immobilize Tritanus, the tricks, at the witch's demand, open a portal back to the magical universe, effectively stranding Tritanus in the infinite ocean while he calls out to Icy in vain. Now, it's time for the ancestral witches to initiate their own plan to control the magical universe. And it starts on Graynor. Back at the monastery, Bloom takes her time during an acquittal. Fancy word for a lunch break. Of justice! To visit a known resident at the temple. Diospro. Diospro is surprised, but welcoming to Bloom. It's here Bloom, admitting that she doesn't know what's about to happen to her, apologizes to Diospro not only for being untrusting back on Domino, but also for, you know, attacking Diospro all those years ago, indirectly sending Diospro into the rage that would see her eventually joining the ranks with Baltor out of desperation and envy. Diaspora likewise apologizes for all she's done, and as they get to talking, she shares how growing up, her parents isolated her and essentially emotionally abused her to live up to their standards. Skye was the only person who would ever treat her like a normal person and allow her to be herself, and this led Diaspora to cling to Skye and develop an unhealthy obsession over him. It does not excuse her actions, but it does put them into context. Really, this moment is to give Bloom a moment to prove she's trying to self-reflect, and also to hammer home the idea that people can change if they put the effort into fixing their behavior. Not everyone is as black and white as some may think. Looking at you, my peeps who say Diaspora was evil from day one, cause yikes. On Graynor, meanwhile, a dark cloud forms over the Tree of Fairies, and the Trix and Ancestral Wishes descend, having been able to enter with the power of Dark Sirenix. The Ancestral Spirit of Nature, as well as the Creature of the Rainbow Mantle, attempt to put up a fight, but are defeated rather easily. And so, surrounding the Tree of Fairies, the Trix recite the Ancestral Wishes new incantation, using the Sirenix powers to extinguish the sparks of the dragon flame present in the tree, eradicating all positive magic in the magical universe. We see the immediate fallout at Alfea, as the fairies attempt to use their powers, only for them to dwindle out in their hands. Sky and the specialists are here to find the Winx, but seeing what's happened, and learning that the girls are on Light Rock, they board the Owl and make their way to Light Rock Monastery. Of course, there's gonna be hell given how many extra-dimensional barriers and protections there are to safeguard the fortress, but when in doubt, torture your characters for fun. And speaking of the fortress, the trial continues. Though as Bloom stands alone, the other Winx stand by her side, refusing to let her face the Council's judgment alone. The trial ceases, however, as Farragonda senses her magic vanishing into thin air. Everyone surmises this is obviously the work of the Ancestral Witches, and it won't be long until all but dark magic have vanished from the magical universe. Roxy, however, still has her powers, since the Fairies of Earth's magic is not rooted in the Tree of Fairies. The specialists arrive, with the owl in very rough shape from the trip, 
Sky apparently knows of a way to restore the Tree of Fairies, and that method lies on Arachleon. And so, while the Winx, Specialist, Roxy, Ortel, and Miriam head there on the Owl, Griffin and Saladin head to Earth to get help from the major fairies to keep the ancestral witches at bay. On the way, Sky tells everyone of the story from Arandora's scroll. Note, include a cute joke about Sky saying he's working on his memory problem because it's okay if he does that. In their younger years, Oratel and Arandor were best friends, and though Arandor did not join the Company of Light, he did pledge that Arachleon's forces would help to protect Domino, and by extension the Dragon Flame from the Ancestral Witches. The Witches, however, approached Arandor in secret. To display their terrifying power, they destroyed Arachleon's most beautiful city out in the seas, the now desolate and forbidden city of Avram. They would do the same to the rest of Arachleon unless Arandor promised to let them attack Domino and without any other choice, Arandor agreed. As a token of this agreement, the Ancestral Witches gave Arandor an hourglass filled with pollen from the Tree of Fairies. After Domino's destruction, Arandor visited Avram to see the devastation firsthand, finding the city to be filled with the citizens' lost souls, and the city itself to constantly shift with dark mirages and illusions. Reaching the top of the city, he threw the hourglass in frustration and self-loathing, and once the pollen was released, it created a small plant of positive magic. The idea is that if they can take this plant to the Tree of Fairies, they might be able to restore its power and bring balance back to the magical universe. Once they arrive on Arachleon, the specialists reveal the old hidden ship that Arandor used to travel to Avram, the Galleon. Since Avram disrupts all techno magic that surrounds it, this ship is their only method of travel to the city. And so, determined to save the magical universe, the group sets out. On Greynor, the Ancestral Witches make themselves all comfy by converting the Tree of Fairies into a makeshift throne. Once they're fully rested, they will begin their conquest of the magical universe. And right on time, Griffin, Saladin, and the major terrestrial fairies arrive for a brawl with the tricks. And this is also personal for Griffin, given, you know, she used to serve the uh, Ancestral Witches. So, uh... Old Company of Light throwback time! On the Galleon, meanwhile, the group encounters a dark storm that crashes their ship into the city of Avram. They're fine, but now they're shit out of luck when it comes to transportation back to the mainland. They ascend the stairs into the city's main entrance, only to find a thick fog of dark magic obscuring their view. Immediately, Bloom and Sky are separated from the group, as are Oratel and Miriam. Back on Greynor, the fight against the Trix is not going well at all, but the Ancestral Witches call it off when they feel a small spark from the tree. A small bud is taking shape, and immediately they recall the hourglass they gave to Arandor all those years ago. Quickly decimating Griffin and Nebula's forces, the Trix and Ancestral Witches head for Arachleon to ensure their victory. In Avram, the main group finds themselves lost amidst the city's winding corridors. Stella thinks she spots Bloom, only to realize it's one of the lost souls of Avram's people crying out in pain. They're surrounded by dark specters and rush to find a way out to the top of the city. Ortel, meanwhile, is absolutely frustrated and unsure of what to think of Arandor's actions, and neither is Miriam. However, Oratel does believe he'd likely have done the same to keep his world and family safe, and that after this mission is over, he wants to at least talk to Arandor about the situation to clear the air. In the Arachleon Royal Palace, meanwhile, Arandor and Samara are attacked by the Trix and the Ancestral Witches. The Trix capture Arandor, forcing him to reveal where he's kept the hourglass, and uh, you, you can guess where this is leading. Cut to the main group over in Avram, where Oratel and Miriam manage to reunite with them, but no one's still sure of where Bloom and Sky are. Right on cue, the Trix and Ancestral Witches arrive, and fight time. Roxy attempts to take on the Trix herself, and though her quick thinking and taking jobs at their insecurities does help, she can't overcome the Witch's raw power and kinda gets the shit beaten out of her. Oratel, however, is separated from the others by Icy, who reveals that she's holding Arandor prisoner. But before she can attack, she's called by Belladonna, the leader of the Ancestral Witches. And so, Icy follows her orders while Oratel gives chase. Up on the surface, Bloom and Sky find themselves in a race as the city collapses around them, with Sky apparently falling into the mist below. Bloom is shocked, but hearing Sky's voice far below, she trusts him and jumps down, and the two reunite and deduce that the city's illusions are trying to keep them away from the positive magic. They walk through the illusions hand in hand, and eventually arrive at the very top of the city where the positive magic in the form of a garden awaits. Before they can reach it, however, Belladonna and Icy attack. 
Ortel arrives and tries to help, but upon trying to save Arendor when Icy drops him, he and Arendor fall into one of the bottomless pits. This does, however, give the two a chance to talk things over, where Ortel says he forgives Arendor. Up at the top, meanwhile, Icy mocks Bloom for her cowardice, leading to all of this chaos, but Bloom jabs back, as she did in episode 2, about Icy repeating her mistakes and how alone she must feel. This aggravates Icy, and trying to kill Bloom, she winds up blasting the garden, sending the positive magic flying all around the city, breaking the seal on the Wink's powers and temporarily restoring their magic. The rest of the group is teleported to the top of the city. The Winks transform and, with Roxy and Miriam's help, manage to kick the Trix's asses a bit. The ancestral witches, furious, possess the tricks completely and attempt to kill Bloom. Arendor jumps in the way and dies as Miriam tries to heal him, telling the Winks that the magical universe will always believe in them, even if it may not seem like it. With this, the Winks, determined to harness the full powers of everyone who still has faith in them, switch into their Believix forms and use Convergence to finally purge the ancestral witches' spirits and destroy them, freeing the tricks and lifting the darkness over Avram, allowing its people to pass on peacefully into the afterlife. Though so Somewhat exhausted after this massive spell, allowing the tricks to escape, the Winks find that even after the pollen's magic is faded, their Believix powers still function, and this gives them an idea. The Winks head to Graynor, where they use their therapeutic powers to restore the Tree of Fairies, sparking an all-new positive magic which once again restores balance to the magical universe. Pleased with the Winx's noble actions, the Book of Fairies reveals itself, and from its pages appears Omnia, the guardian of the infinite ocean. Because of all they've done, she's decided that the Winks are indeed worthy of Cyrenix, and charges them with stopping the Trix and Tritanis and closing the pathway to the infinite ocean once and for all. And because of her own actions in assisting the Winx and displaying the same virtues each of them represent, Roxy is also deemed worthy to everyone's surprise. Cue the long-awaited Cyrenix transformation of all seven of the Winx. That's fucking right, bitch. Also note, though I cut Harmonix for its pointlessness, I still love its design, so for right now, applying it to Cyrenix with some changes here and there, uh, not really relevant right now, but I would just like to state Harmonix is fucking gorgeous and deserved better. But not all is well, however. Though the ancestral witches are gone, this also means any remnants of their dark powers have faded as well. This includes the mysterious water dragon on Domino, which transforms back into a still ghastly specter, Politea. Though she's still a victim of the Cyrenix curse, she is now free to pursue her liberation, and shit is about to get wild. So there you go, the first half of my season 5 rewrite. I really hope you enjoyed that because goddamn this was probably one of my most ambitious projects and it's not even done yet. I don't know when I'll be releasing part 2, as of finishing recording this I still have to write the damn thing. I mean I have, I have the story outline but I mean like write the script for the video. But I do hope that you will check it out when it eventually drops. And who knows, I might do the same with season 6. Okay, I'm absolutely doing this for season six because this is just a lot of fun for me. And truth be told, as much as I love season four, um, my friend getting into it has proven it is a lot more flawed than I remember. And now I want to rewrite that too. And it's fucking hell. Anyways, if you enjoyed this, well, first of all, thank you for sticking along for this wild ride. Second, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications of my new videos because YouTube hates creators. And if you would like to support what I do, please also consider if you are willing and able pledging your support over on Patreon. I'm the Unicorn of War, and I, I am tired. <laughs>